Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we start, I would like to draw your attention to my weekly email newsletter, Friday Focus. Each Friday, I focus on one topic with one action arising. The link to sign up is in the show notes or head over to amyrolinson.com and sign up right now. Today on Focus on Why, I am joined by R. Michael Anderson. Welcome, Michael. How are you doing? You're very good, Amy. Thanks for having me. Well, it's an absolute pleasure. We are fellow speakers in the Professional Speaking Association. Not to say I'm a fellow myself, but actually we are both within the organization and that's how we met. So how is it you are in the PSA and what is it you're focusing on at the moment? Well, Amy, I'm uh, American. Obviously, this isn't a Scottish accent or anything. Um, and we know each other from the UK, uh, London branch. And I married a lovely British woman five years ago. So that's how I find myself over here. You British women are are lovely. So here I am. And um, instead of the boring work things, I'll tell you that I'm doing right now. Uh, so for people that obviously can't see uh, listening to this, I'm, I'm, six, I'm a six foot eight American and I'm 52. So what I've been doing for the, I've been playing full court basketball for the first time in a decade. And it's so good because I played it all growing up in university. I played semi-pro and then there was a long time off. So it is, it's like I'm have, I, I play once a week on Saturday mornings. And I think about it all week, Amy. It's like, it's the, the most fun thing that I picked up in years. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really enjoying that. And that's a sport that's typically associated with taller people. I was one of the games makers at the London Olympics and my responsibility was the basketball and also gymnastics. So I had a huge diversity in, in size of the of the people coming through the door. Uh, but it is I mean, it is obviously a great sport. And I, I one of my fa- most famous favorite documentaries is The Last Dance. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, that, there's so much in there about excellence and drive and focus and and um and teamwork it it uh it, it was a great why people that aren't even into to basketball i think got a lot out of it yeah the netflix are doing some really good documentaries at the moment particularly around sport so what is it that you has driven you back onto the court having had a break for a while oh well the you know basketball is is when i play basketball it's just it's I'm so present, you know, I, I do meditate, but meditate, meditation is great in one area, but there's just to, to be, it sounds weird, but to be sweating in a gym with a bunch of guys or you know, women play sometimes too, but about, you know, a bunch with a bunch of people that are just there to do that. Nobody's talking about work. Nobody's worried about what's happening at home. And it's, I played so much of it that I could, I just shut off and, and it's so enjoyable and I'm so in the flow. It's really just so healthy on so many different levels um, that it really just just brings me back. And I didn't realize how much I missed it until I I started doing it again. So being present in the moment and being able to be in flow and shutting off from everything else, where else are you in that similar state? Well, the funny thing is, so I do a lot of keynote speaking, and I would say the keynote speaking gives me that same thrill of playing basketball in front of an audience or or a crowd where it's it's me people are folk i mean in basketball it's 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 a team you know people are going to see what you do and you're on stage you're on the court and have to perform and it it's there's a pressure it's a fun pressure but there's definitely a pressure and it gives me a thrill. I, I like I like responsibility. I like um, preparing. I like being set up to do a good job or not do a good job based on how I perform. And that's very competitive. And that to me, that's really really exciting. 
to do. And that is absolutely true that speaking gives me the same rush and thrill of playing in front of a in front of a crowd. And I guess the, the difference being that one is solely reliable on you and the other one is a team. That's that's true. That's true. And it, it, it is a different vibe. And it's such a I think speaking, sometimes I'm in the middle of a speech and it could be in front of 10 people, it could be in front of thousands, but the 10 people could be, you know, CEOs of billion dollar companies. And then I'll, I, my, the back of my mind will ask myself, like, Michael, everybody is focused on you. There's, there's nothing else. Anybody is there. It, and it really, for a, for a split second there, I just really realized that I have everybody's attention and they're, they're, they're listening to me. And sometimes that's like, it's like, who are they? Who, who am I to be speaking in front of all these powerful people? Other times are like, this is pretty amazing. It comes in different flavors, but it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a very intense inner dialogue that uh, I go through. And that focus on you, is that something that you spend much time and you mentioned you do meditating so how does that differ that sort of focus on you and being aware of it in a, in a public space and then also being in a private space doing that i'm gonna do the politician thing and not answer your question but answer a similar question because <laughs> what i was just thinking about is leadership because i teach leadership and i think to be a great leader you have to realize that people are focused on you now, this is a connection i just made and that's why i'm bringing it up that, um, you know, if you accept the mantle of leadership, and most of us accept that we get promoted or we start a business, you know, sometimes it falls to us, but those are normally not as, as, as common. Um, but when you are like, yes, I'm going to take this promotion, I'm going to start this business, you are taking the responsibility of leading others. And what you do is your actions are a reflection of how they're going to see you as a leader. And it's not easy, and it takes a lot of internal resilience. And some people get into leadership, and they don't want to take that responsibility. And I think that's 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 wrong of them. That that you when you sign up for leadership, that you sign up to have that focus on you. And if you don't want them, you possibly should not be a leader. So tell me a bit more about why leadership is is your particular space of area that you like to speak about and and you're working in well my leadership journey was very tumultuous um i started as a programmer i worked my way up the corporate ladder i got good at management i got knew about business i'm smart i'm driven and in my mid-30s i moved back to california and started my first software business and i there was a gap in the marketplace, so we get, became very, very successful very, very quickly. All organic growth. I didn't raise money or, or borrow money or anything. In a couple million, in a, in a couple of years, we were big enough where I was on the front page of the newspaper. I had an office. I had insurance people, bankers, attorneys, I, and I never had to deal with any of them. I had no support, no mentors. It was really, I was really out of my depth, um, and it. And there's a long dramatic story about substance abuse, and I would go in and out of depressions, and um, it was it was, and I was I had to work so I felt like such an imposter and such a fraud, and I had this, even though we were successful, Amy, I had this massive fear that, that somebody would find out that I have no clue what I'm doing, and it would all come tumbling down, and. Uh, and I was I was working so hard to make it look like I had it all covered. Because people would be like, Mike, you have an amazing life. I'm like, oh my God, I hate my life. I'm so stressed. I have no clue what I'm doing. I have all this responsibility. And um, it was really hard. And I uh and that was on just the mental health issue, but on the leadership issue, I was not my idea of leadership was just getting a bunch of to-dos in, passing them out to everybody. And if they didn't get them done as fast or as well as I thought. I would just get frustrated and angry. And obviously that didn't go well. Um, I, you know, I had a couple friends that I hired quit and they're like, I don't, you don't have a good culture. And 
intellectually, I sort of knew what a culture was, but I really didn't know what my culture was or how to affect it. And so I, I didn't know what to do there. And um, we started losing clients we shouldn't have lost. And and it would because we, we got to a point where I needed to be a leader. And I didn't have any clue how to do that. I knew how to manage projects. I knew the technology, but I had no clue about purpose, vision, culture, teamwork, communication, motivation, inspiration. And, uh, you know, I finally figured some stuff out. So I teach, I teach other leaders because I know how difficult emotionally that was for me and how uh, I, I was just so, so lost. And so I try to help people do the same thing I did without having to take a bunch of hard drugs and getting divorced and everything else. Yeah. And, and that gulf between the perception of other people seeing from the outside this amazing life that they thought were living and you saying, oh my goodness, I hate my life. How can that have such a two different sides to the coin there? What, what was the what was going on? I think with high a lot often high achieving people, we some of us are driven by a lack of self-worth, and we gain that self-worth by achieving. And we find we tell ourselves that once I get to my company earns this amount of money or I get promoted to this. And these are subconscious decisions. Or once I get promoted to this level, then I'll be worthy. Then I'll be loved. Then I'll be happy. Um, but the, the, if if we have those dialogues, there's no amount of money that we can make, or there's no amount of level that we can scale our company that we're going to get that because it's a, it's a moving goal. And often high achievers, me and other high achievers I work with, we, part of our willpower is we can put on that face. We can put on, we can show people what we want to show them because we have massive inner re resources. But unfortunately, the inner resources are sometimes trying to deal with these issues that we have, this doubt in ourselves, this fear that anything could, could come crumbling down, that we really don't know, what we're, we're just winging it. And then we just put up this this mask so that nobody knows we're going through that. And that's that's obviously not healthy for a lot of reasons. And you spoke about how people don't like the responsibility in business. What about life? Yeah. Well, I mean, so many successful business people and they're like, oh, I do everything for my family. Yet they're working 60 or 80 hours and like their family doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, their family, you know, might like the nice house, but their family would like their father or their mother to be home more than a half a Saturday and a Sunday and, and you know, 8 p.m. On, on the weekdays. And, you know, it's a big lie that they tell themselves. And it's so much easier for them to force themselves into more work and not be present and intimate with their family um, that they chose choose that route, but then they they cover it up with my family's the most important thing. So it's a big that's a big disconnect. And this lie that people are telling themselves, it sounds like it's something that you've experienced firsthand. You know, I still do. I still get addicted to work. I still find myself you know, if a, if a client would cancel a day with me instead of taking that day off and maybe spending time with my wife or my son if he's home or whatever that is, sometimes I'll just rush with projects and and and, and appointments to fill that day up. Which the world's going to go on if I don't work that day or I take some time to myself. You know, I'm uh, you know I run my own business now, so it, it's I don't have anybody to answer to in that aspect and and. Um, the addiction to work, you know, I talk about self-limiting beliefs and I say, how many are addicted to work? And all the high achievers are like, that's me. And it, um, it's, it, it really can sneak up on us even when we're not, even when we know that can happen to us. And is there a solution? <laughs> yeah. I mean, awareness, um, you, you know, you can put in systems, you can say, hey, I'm a, you can put in disciplines. You can say, I'm only going to work 30 hours a week. I'm going to shut everything off at 5 PM. It can be as simple as that. Um, it can be, you can go deeper and heal the reasons that you, you, you do these things. Um, 
and different things work for different people. That's that might be a whole nother episode, Amy. That might be a whole nother one. <laughs> well, I'm just buying on your bookshelf behind you the four hour work week. Now, you know, do you subscribe to that? You know, I, I think Tim Ferriss, it, it, it's a good book to read just to open up your thinking. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a creator. You know, you talk about why, why. One of the things I like to do is create, and I create through business, and I create, I really touch people's lives through what I do. And my wife loves her job too, and so do I. So I like to work. I would not want to work only four hours a week. I, I love what I do. Um, and I think in very, very certain circumstances you could work four hours a week um i don't think the world would go around if we'd all be working four hours a week and uh and if you're in a good position you you, you can really like enjoy work and things and um so i think uh that book to me just i like to read i, I read it a while ago and it just gets my brain thinking a little bit he, he he's sort of like um throws out crazy ideas, but crazy ideas sometimes can lead to, to not so crazy ideas that are, that are practical. And that's the creator side of things, right? It is. It is. Cause I can get caught into, um, group think just like everybody else. So when you describe yourself as a creator, are you thinking from the perspective of wealth dynamics or talent dynamics as it's known in terms of Roger Hamilton's framework or how do you so you've got mechanic and star sitting either side of you or is it a case of creator in that you just have to be innovating yeah I don't know what wealth I have heard of wealth dynamics I'm, I'm not talking about in that framework and I'm not creative I mean I have creativity but I'm not a creative when I say creator I like to and it's like I'm not a, even a creator with like building things, <laughs> but I like to create businesses. I like to create value. I, as a programmer, I've always liked creating software programs that, that really ran well and efficiently and elegant. And I, if I don't, I really like projects that I'm creating something. I don't like maintenance of things. Um, I like to, I like to, yeah, when I'm creating something, I like, whether it's a, a community, whether it's a, a book, whether it's a product, whether it's a speech, that the act of creation. And somebody said, you know, at the, at the core level, we're all creators. We create, whether it's a baby or a family or a business or a meal, you know, we're put on earth. It's it's like what we're meant to do is to create. I always thought that was pretty interesting. And with that, it's a lovely segue because I believe that we create our own purpose. We don't find it. I agree. This purpose, it's an interesting because I think some people think that we have this, this purpose that the universe has given us. And once we find it, we're going to be so rich and happy for the rest of our life. And I think that's a, that's a bit of a dangerous myth out there. Um, yeah, and my purpose has changed. I've thought about this. My purpose has changed as I get into different stages of life. You know, my purpose now that I'm in my 50s is definitely different than when I was in my 20s. When I was in my 20s, I was out there to gain experience, to gain wisdom, to gain knowledge, to understand myself. Um, and I think that's great to do in your 20s. And you know, some people, as a keynote speaker, people are always like, oh, I want to you know, I want to do what you do, but I'm in my 20s. Well, you know, you need something to speak about. That doesn't mean no speakers are in their 20s, but normally people want somebody with a couple decades of experience to tell them how to do stuff because, you know, you learn stuff over. I mean, that's a bit, that's that's a broad stroke there. But, you know, there's there's reasons that a lot of people that are, that, that teach have been through, you know, a couple decades, if not of things. And so um, I definitely, for me, yeah, my my purpose and my why has definitely changed in different stages of my life. And where is it right now for you, Michael? What is it you're focusing on? Well, I um, I really feel like I'm doing what I've been doing for the last ten years, and I, which is you could might say be a thought leader, be a speaker, author, you know, teacher, whatever. I do do a little bit, little bit of those everything, but it's really taken me time to understand what I know that's, that's unique. A lot of people teach leadership. And there's a lot of really good stuff out there on leadership. 
but I, I'm lucky to have a master's in psychology and, and some neuroscience training as well. And I understand, and I've also been had the practical experience of being a leader. And I know emotionally what it, what you have to go through to be a leader. And then I know I have all the psychology and neuroscience. And that's why I teach leadership mindset. I don't teach management. I don't teach these abstract academic leadership models, which I don't even understand when I read some of these books. Look, I know when you get into get in, when you get into to work, something might happen. Like, you know, your one thing that happened to me was my marketing manager came in, said the that the sales director who she sat right across from said something sexually inappropriate to her. And it's like, well, how do you handle that as a leader? How do you where what's your value? And 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 so there's all these mindset things that I think that I that I needed to know. And it took me really a, a decade to really find out where I sat, where my value was. And I agree what you said, you have to find your purpose. And, and people want to, people like me, like all of us, we want to contribute to the world. I mean, it, it's rarely do people contribute to the world and not like it. It happens sometimes. But I think what's fun is really helping people change and grow and evolve. And um by teaching this leadership mindset, I can really see the changes in people. And I know that, that those are the changes that I needed to go through. And so my purpose is really doing this on a bigger level. I've really worked a lot to put some of these psychology tools into really bite-sized pieces so people can learn them in an easy, fast way and to implement that into their real-life leadership. Um, I believe that leadership, so many people every leader needs to make these shifts. Some people are lucky enough to have a great coach or a mentor. A lot of people out there are really struggling with imposter syndrome, self-doubt, executive presence. And, and it's so fun for me to see people really get that and report back. Oh my gosh, I finally did great at this board meeting. And I finally, my, my team says they finally see me as that strategic leader. So that's uh, it's really fun for me. So it's really just scaling this up and doing it, helping all the people out there that need it. And you, you shared that your own leadership journey had been tumultuous. And is that from a, a confused experience? Is it a case of it wasn't just an easy ride? You were, were you expecting it to be easy? I don't. I didn't understand leadership back then. I, I you know, I heard of the, the word a thousand times, but uh, and I had some decent leaders as mentors, but as people to look up to. We'll say people to look up to. People I reported to but they never really taught me leadership in that specific of a term. And, um, and it really took it, but also I was very unconscious. So I, I was, I don't think I had great awareness of myself or others. Um, I see a lot of these, a lot of younger people younger than me when they're in their late twenties or thirties, I'm like, you are so far ahead of me. <laughs> than I was ever, because I, I relied a lot on my intelligence and drive and my, I, I was not emotionally intelligent and which caused endless issues personally and professionally. Um, and, uh, though if I would, if I would have learned a little bit about emotional intelligence when I was, gosh, if I, in, in my early teens, I, that would have helped me so much the rest of my life. You know, a lot of what I teach is, in a way, advanced emotional intelligence specifically for leaders, but a lot of people that I work with get so much, they learn so much about who they are, because I believe a leader really knows, has to know who they are to be a great leader. And for me, I was so insecure, I wanted to be so accepted that I was spending so much of my energy trying to be somebody that I thought people wanted me to be, so I'd be respected and liked and everything else. And obviously that didn't work. And, um, but I didn't know any better at that time. So if you had to describe who you would like or who you believe Michael Anderson is now, how would you describe yourself? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, I know what people tell me and I know how I view myself and people are much more, they see a warmth and compassion in me. Um, a lot of people tell me that very consistently, which I really, I really, that really touches my heart. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very analytical. I try to be very compassionate. I work on my compassion. Uh, I really work on my mindfulness. Um, but the thing is, 
I believe that I'm so analytical that, that the emotional intelligence, it's, I feel that I have to work on it and the mindfulness. I feel that I have to work on it because I'm, that's so against how I'm wired. And I guess that's why I'm successful is because I've learned how to temper being, being driven and being intelligent and being analytical is, is our great advantages, but I was just overloaded on them. So I really work hard on balancing that with, with communication, with slowing down, but it, it's, it, it is work. It doesn't happen naturally. I keep waiting for my, my, myself to, to like get to this place where I'm, I don't need to meditate so much. Or I don't need to do so much work on myself. Um, but I think that that's just how I'm wired and how I need to balance myself. So, um, I am very focused. I'm competitive. I've really worked uh, my whole life to not be the last bunch of decades to not be negative competitive, to be positive competitive. You know, I don't want to crush anybody anymore. I want me and all of us to win. Um, so yeah, that, that's a long answer to your, your question. Well, just picking up on, on the emotions and, and you talking about being emotionally intelligent and also being analytical, but also opening up different types of emotions. Something that came to my mind when you were saying that is that we cannot selectively numb our emotions. It's uh, because when we numb the painful emotions, we also numb the positive ones. It was something that uh, Brené Brown said. And it is interesting just how you're you're analytical. You're bringing that analysis to the, the space. You spoke about taking time to understand. You spoke about how you're you're good at reflection and meditation and i'm just looking to it's capturing that awareness and you've done your you've you've got a master's in psychology and, and some experience in neuroscience i just want to know like how much emotion now comes into your work how much emotion comes into my work depends on the work that i'm doing it depends on what you mean by <laughs> defined by emotion <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 fairly open. I mean, it was just a case of you said you, you're it's so against about how you're wired, but you know that we are able to rewire. Yes, yes. Well, I do know whether we're able to. I guess there's two parts to that. I believe that we have basically a personality, and part of it's re re rewireable. And I believe that. No matter what I do, I'm always going to have that analytical part of me. I believe that's that's part of me. Um, you know, it's like I will never be a musician. I just know that that's I can appreciate music and I could probably get OK at a thing, but I'm just not. That, that's a non part of a wired type of thing. But, you know, when you talk about emotion, um, it is especially about the compassion and the listening uh, that comes in a lot. I mean, as simple as listening and, and, and empathy really comes in a lot. When it comes to the deeper emotions of what of the emotions driving behavior and the subconscious emotion or the emotion that we may be trying to avoid, that comes more in on my one-on-one -on -one or sometimes the group coaching. Um, but the awareness, I you know, I believe self-awareness is a lot about leadership mindset to, to really to, to have the right mindset as leader, you have to have great awareness of yourself and others. And I guess from that point of view, there's a lot of emotional intelligence. Like, am I upset right now? Is that person upset? Why are we upset? How can we come to a thing? How can we come to a, a good resolution? Where are they coming from? Where am I coming from? So yeah, I guess there, there is a lot of emotion. And you, we, was, we started out the conversation talking about how you were in flow, being on court and being in flow on stage. And it's very much being in touch with what's going on for you there, that the competitive element is clearly there of, of wanting to do well and perform. What is it you'd like to make the audience feel when you're speaking? Well, the, the, the couple of things that I do, it's like, if, if you're a leader and you're struggling, welcome to the club, that's okay. You know, you've taken on a, a difficult role. And if, you know, it's probably like... <laughs> being a mom, you know, it's like, I, I, you know, my, my, my wife, uh, cause my 12 year old's my stepson, but my wife and I, I listen, you know, if I catch some of the things that the, the, the people are telling the moms, it's like, it's okay not to know everything. And you know, that's going to happen when you're a mom, it's like a leader too. It's like, look, stuff can happen. You had no idea about, and you're going to make the wrong decision, but you know what? You are going to make the wrong decision. You're going to doubt yourself sometimes. And you're going to be like, Oh my gosh, can I get through this? Do I have enough resilience? We all do that. 
And so if you're, if you're doing, you're not, if you're experiencing that, there's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken. <laughs> you know, that's par for the course. Um, so I want to tell people that, that they're okay if they're feeling that. So that's one thing I want them to, to, to be, to have that self-compassion. The other thing is I want them to believe in themselves a bit more, get to know themselves a bit more and believe in themselves a bit more, because when they believe in themselves, then their team's going to believe in them. If a leader doesn't believe in themselves, their team is never going to believe in them. And that doesn't mean that they're going to like know all the answers to all everything. That means that they're going to figure it out. Because normally people that get to leadership are very good doers and they're very smart. Now they have to lead, lead others to, to be the, those smart people, but they still have these amazing, this amazing willpower and intelligence. They just have to redirect it a little bit, but to have faith in themselves, they're going to figure out whatever comes. I definitely see the warmth and compassion coming out in what you're sharing. <laughs> Good. Thank you. <laughs> it, 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 what also comes to mind is one of my favorite business books, and you drew the parallel there about being a parent and also being a leader is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And he talks about parenting throughout that book. It's been a while since I read that. Um, I have a friend who reads it every year. I'm like, that's that's cool. Um, yeah, and, you know, parenting, being a uh, you know, stepfather has taught me so much about getting, because, you know, my son, the more I wanted to do something, sometimes I think the less he wants to do it. And um, which, granted, I was probably similar too. But it just it's really taught me a lot about motivation and and asking the right questions and getting them on board. Um, and and it really is. it It really is a a master class in motivation and engagement. And you know it's it's as simple as asking them a question rather than telling them to do something is the is the can be the 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 difference between success and failure. So what's next on the agenda for you, michael? what what is, what have you got planned? Well, my goal, my vision is to make Leadership Mindset 2.0, my last, my latest book, ubiquitous in leadership. And because nobody else I find is teaching exactly this. A lot of coaches do, you know, can do can do things, but I really work to put them in a teachable thing, so, a teachable format. So I real I want anytime anybody gets into leadership or leadership role, I want my book to land on their desk because somebody's like, oh, you made it to this level here. You absolutely got to read this book. And so that's really my job, Amy, is to get this great stuff in everybody's hands. And what particularly is it that you would love everybody to adopt? I would I would love everybody to adopt what I what I say the foundational rule of leadership is is your leadership is a reflection of your relationship with yourself. And this is based on a psychological concept called a projection where your relationship with yourself mirrors every other relationship in your life. And I really would like people to look at the relationship with themselves and get to know, like, and trust themselves. Really get to know who they are. And and that sounds easier said than done. Um, and, and, and sometimes it's a life, for me, it's a lifetime journey anyway. But to get to know who they are, because they need to bring that out as a leader, but not just know who they are, but like who that person is and trust that person. And there's a lot of self-compassion and self-acceptance in that in that process. I mean, you could make a case that it's all self-compassion and self-acceptance. Because when we real and when we really just own who we are, and that's the good parts and the shadow parts, as Young would say as well. Then we can be that 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 true self, and that's where that that healthy authenticity and vulnerability come from. That's so often talked about, but not often uh, explained what that really means. Because people want to know who we are, and people want to know that we're a human being and that we make mistakes. and And the more human we can show, our the more humanness we can show everybody, the more people are going to be endeared to us. And what will happen? If this is the end result in business, that this it becomes reality, where your goal and vision is achieved. Oh my gosh! I think that 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 I, I'm a big believer in businesses and and, and capitalism, and I think capitalism has been. I mean, there's there's parts that aren't working, but businesses can be such a force for good and leaders can be such a force for good because we create the culture and we create how 
respect and communication and relationships. And when people are doing that from their authentic selves instead of their egos, when people are stepping up, it just makes everybody everybody's life better. And if we can, I mean, if we can shift from leadership 10% from from negative being driven by negativity to positivity, I mean, the world would just make it a massive shift. And that would be, yeah, maybe I can be a little part of that or a big part, Amy. I'm not limiting myself, you know. I don't want to play small. I want to play big. So I love that. How would people get in contact with you, Michael? They love what you hear. Obviously, your book is available. What else could they do? Yeah, it's rmichaelanderson.com. I have a, I have a Facebook group um, that's uh, Leadership Mindset 2.0. I post things in there. Um, and it's R. Michael Anderson. And I, I that's my first name is Robert. I'll tell everybody that's secret. So it's R. R. Michael Anderson for Robert. And it's really, and if I can ever help anybody out, just drop me a note on LinkedIn or whatever it is. I love to hear from leaders. Um, if you, in fact, if you tell me it's from Amy's podcast, maybe I'll drop you a free gift if you connect me on LinkedIn so we can have some fun with that. Um, and, you know, I'm just really here to serve leaders and, and have them, yeah, just just raise their game a bit, raise their mindset, understand what's going on. And because everybody, everybody wants to be successful. Everybody wants to create pretty much everybody. I mean, 99.9% of leaders want to create a great culture, want to give back to the community, want themselves to be successful and their team. We just don't always know how. And so that's really what I've worked is create that, to create that roadmap. I love that. And knowing how you have evolved and grown and developed from your 20s through to your 50s. Do you see a next version of your leadership mindset coming out? I hope not. I freaking hate writing books. Gosh, gosh. I put my best stuff in here, Amy. You asked me about my next book already. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to write. This is it for a while. I might, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just going to really, just, just to really deepen into this content and get it out there in all the different ways that I can. Yeah. Yeah. My bad for jumping ahead. You haven't even got this vision achieved yet. So let's just focus on that. <laughs> I love it though. I love, I love when I love going, going big though. I love it. That's brilliant. So I just want to say thank you for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure and I will put your links into the show notes and, and mention that there is a, a gift available. If they choose to connect with you, that'd be fantastic. Have you got some final words for the audience, please, Michael? Yeah, I got the, the words that I wish I would have told myself before. And I try to tell myself every day, it's like, look, let yourself off the hook, everybody, give yourself a break. If you if you're listening to this, you're probably a high achiever. And if if and you're probably your own worst critic, you probably do amazing things out there. And don't take it all so seriously, no matter what comes up, you got it. Give yourself a break. You know, <laughs> Take a half an hour off. Go walk around the, the, you know, go walk around the block. You deserve it. Play with your dog. Play with your cat. Play with your kid. Play with your husband. Whoever you just take a little bit of time out. It don't take it all so seriously, because you know you're amazing. You got this. You've done such amazing things in the past, and you will do in the future. So let yourself off the hook right now. How has this conversation had an impact on you? What value have you received from tuning in? What are your reflections with actions? Please take a moment to leave me an Apple podcast or Spotify review sharing how Focus on Why has made a difference to you today. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, simply connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter or join the Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.